I'm Mark, and I'm look, and, and I look like a homeless person. I need to like, I need to like shower. Yeah. We had the type of nights when morning comes too soon, Ooh. and nothing was the same. Watch me going out of the way when I should have went home. Only time of the day I get to spend on my own. I was tripping off high, used to sleep at your crib. Should drive out right where you live and pick you up on the way. We ain't spoken so long, probably put me in the past. I don't know if that helped or not. Hi, who are you? Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm the author of Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. Hi, I'm Mark, uh, the curator of the Big Big Mess reading series. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm the author of Nothing Was the Same. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a wolf doctor. Hi, I'm Mark, and I am an unreleased colorway of a Jordan 11 that you really want, but is never going to be made available to the public. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm clean shaven. Hi, I'm Mark, and my face is made of Adderall. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a hug tornado. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm that episode of Dawson's Creek when Joey loses her virginity. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a proper noun. Hi, I'm Mark, and I am a Jordan 18 that, that nobody, nobody wants. How would you describe your approach to making the poems in I'm Just Happy to Be Here? Um, I approached this book by trying to make something that was fun. Like, I wanted to, like write the least boring book of poetry that like I could possibly write. So like when I was like sitting down like editing the thing, I was like, okay, do you do you sound like a poet here or do you sound like somebody who like would remind like another person of like like the best French kiss they ever had? Is this title like like really solipsistic or is it more like, you know, you're hugging somebody that you haven't seen since grammar school. Like, I wanted it to be like, like probably like the, like, like the, the best combination of like ice cream flavors you could possibly have on one cone. Like I approached that by like, you know, like borrowing like a lot of um, stuff from like, like famous poets like Ezra Pound and like by like, like writing phrases of Drake albums and um, like using like colloquial like language. These are things that surround like my everyday life, right? Like fucking like I am the kind of person in the slightest is gonna be like, oh, let me have some like postmodernist discourse. It's not like I look at like a ham sandwich and I'm like, oh man, that like really reminds me of like post-colonialism. Like, I mean like that's not, that shit doesn't excite me. I wanna write about real things, tangible things. Things you could hold, smell, taste, feel rap about, put on your foot. So that's really, that was what my goal was when I sat down to write this book was, how can you have something tangible that could be really enjoyable on a surface level, but also punch you somewhere like emotionally? Tell us about one living and one dead writer who make you want to write. The living writer is probably Dorothy Alasky, who to me, like just in many ways, like, I read um, Poetry Is Not A Project, and, and I highly suggest that you read it too. And what that like, really did for me was like, it really made me feel as if, um, you know, like everything about the world and everything I understood about it was, was for naught. And that like, poetry was not so much like a, like, like a, a form, so much as it was a, a, like, like a form of writing, as much as it was like, a lens in which you can share and enjoy and experience the world and like it's like when I read Black Life for the first time and I was I was just blown away that like all these like mundane things could be painted in like such a glorious like beautiful like like emotional landscape that made me feel so many different things in so many different strange strange ways so if not for Dottie I wouldn't understand what poetry could do and one dead writer like I try not to read a whole lot of dead writers I'm, I'm in poetry for like the high fives and like you can't you can't high five a dead person like I mean maybe you can high five a dead person like the elbow like it would just get anyways one dead writer that like really like like really inspired me is uh, Frank uh... <laughs>
I'm <laughs> trying to say Kenneth Coke and I say Frank O'Hara's. So one dead writer that really did inspire me is Kenneth Koch. Uh, I, when my buddy Mike showed me uh, to you for the first time, like it, it just felt like a religious like experience. Like, loving someone the way a detective would love a walnut that helped him, you know, solve a case that had gone cold for like you know however many years it is. Like that to me, like I didn't know that that's what poetry could do. I didn't know that it could be this like uninhibited like like bit of joy that you could have with the world and the joy i felt as a reader i i it just blew me away so and that's like really like that made me like feel like when i read kenneth coke like i want to fuck people the same way kenneth coke fucked me right now like i i want that like i want to be able to to like reach people and speak to them in such a true like no frills no bullshit manner and um so yeah, those two to me are, they're like pillars and people I go back to with like some frequency when it comes to like coming up my own work. Can you say anything about the integration of hip hop in your work? Yes. Um, so the thing that's like most fascinating about hip hop to me is um, appropriation as like an artistic device. And I don't necessarily mean like like sampling of like, you know, like jazz beats and shit like that. Like what I really mean is um, like, you know, like the, like thievery and like the stealing and, and uh, appropriating of like lyrics. So like, and like, I do that a lot. Um, so like, for example, in a uh, creation myth, uh, which was one of the first poems of my book, I flat out steal uh, from Mercy by Kanye West. Well, it is what we been on the moon. And so that line, like that line right there, like that, you know, it's not like Kanye brought somebody in to sing a hook there. That line is, comes straight from like this old like 70s reggae song by this guy Fuzzy Jones, right? And uh, and that song is explicitly about like killing sound boys and like a sound boy like is like, you know, like kind of like a punk, right? But what's even crazier about that is like, you know, like there is a weeping and a moaning and a gnashing of teeth, like it's not like Fuzzy Jones pulled that out of his ass or anything. Like, that's from the fucking Bible. Like, like that's, like, peppered, like, all throughout the fucking Bible. So, like, so like to think that, like, you know, Fuzzy Jones was like, all right, well, how, like, he, he used that bit from the Bible to, like, you know, hit on a certain emotional note, like, in his song. And then Kanye took that and was like, well, all right, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, like, pair that with, like, uh, okay, Lamborghini Mercy, yo chick she so thirsty, I'm in that 2 c Lambo with your girl, she trying to jerk me. Just, like, just chop and screw that shit, throwing in, like, the, you know, the bit from Scarface is in there as well. Let the suicide doors up, I do suicides on the tour bus. But it ends up, like, like, coming, like, coming off as is, like, a club banger, like, and that's, that's, like, what, like, what's happening there. So it's, like, all these, like, different, like, different things that are borrowing and stealing from each other. And like, you know, like, you know, I heard Mercy, oh, it's like, it's like, I pumped the bass and shit. So like, that's what I want my poetry to do to you. Like, and like well, that poem in particular, like with it being about my birth mom and like, you know, like it's like, it's like kind of like very mythical. And like, I'm stealing from Lithuanian myths when like, she was like, you know, like 15 and pregnant, like, my mom was a fucking trap beat. Like, goddamn right I'm gonna steal from Kanye. Like, to me it's like makes like perfect sense that like, that like you would take like that sort of like emotional like co like content and like figure out a way to reappropriate that for the reader. And then like, you know, if you catch on to that and you're like, that sounds familiar. Like, whereas if like your brain does that bit of work and you're like, oh, okay. So, and you could start like seeing like all these different connections happening. Um, so like, the thing to me is like, why does that have to be unique to hip-hop and it's not right like i mean like it's like i remember i read like those great dylan uh welsh poems that are on um keyhole where he like flat out like does an erasure of jules book and like turns this like what is typically like this really kind of like crappy like you know like joke of of like an artistic device like jules book and then like turns into this like kind of beautiful thing so i'm like i'm very into this idea that like we can readjust and appropriate the world in how we see fit. I always like to think of like, like, like the poet's job is like see the world as if like, 
as if like it's stars, right? Like the world is just stars. And then the poet comes in and like, they're creating these constellations. They're like, well, okay. So like, like you know, you're looking like, oh, that's a big dipper. But like, what, what motherfucker how many ever years ago was like, oh, that looks like a fucking like, that, lo that looks like a fucking like, like a ladle. Like, well, fuck your ladle, right? Like, I want that ladle to look like, I don't know. Like, I want that ladle to look like a fucking, like a new era fitted hat. How do I re rearrange the world in this way that like, you could see something that I see, even though we're all like looking at the same thing, right? So like, that's why I love borrowing from hip hop is like, it's just another way in which like, I could create these like magical constellations like in the world. How, how cool would I look like if I had a hat on? Like, I mean, I am bolding. So what's the first album you remember acquiring? Uh, the Score by the Fugees. It's not the first one I like I had, but it's the first one I remember because it had the parental advisory sticker and, um, you know, I come from a good Catholic family and my mom, you know, like was really in the Barbara Bush and like didn't want me to have like my mind spoiled or anything along those lines. And, uh, but I remember we were in Costco and, um, like we found the, I found like, like they found the copy where like the promotional sticker was like over the parental advisory sticker. So like I, I schemed my mom into getting it. And like I went home, like listen to all these bad words. It was great. You know, it's really funny though. Like, you know, it's really funny is like a couple years ago, somebody like, like cut up that album and took like out all the prizes, like, like lyrics. So like there's a version out there. It's like, it has like nothing but Lauren Hill and Wyclef on it. And it's like, it's like heaven, right? Like the album's really good to begin with, but then like, once you cut out like pros, it's like 150 times better. How would you describe your relationship to the internet? Oh, I'm having like a long, long monogamous relationship with the internet, and 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 I'm not I'm not going anywhere. I should propose or something. It's just crazy, like the way things have shifted, like in the last like you know like couple of years. Like so, we started Big Lux. Like we like like all right, we want to do a print journal. Like that's like really what we want to do. We want to be a print journal. But then like. Now, like, you, you don't need to be a print journal to be a legitimate, like, literary, like, place. You could have, like, a poem posted, like, on a Tumblr, right? And, like, did, did you post yourself on a Tumblr, and then, like, you end up reaching, like, like, thousands of people because, like, you know, you just write hashtags, or, like, you know, you cued into, like, you know, like, the right person retumbled you. Like, I remember I had a poem published in the second issue of Sway, and, um, like, a couple days after, like, like it had been published, like I realized I had like a hundred retumbles or something like that. And then like, the thing is like when I started like, I went in and I started like clicking the people who like had been retumbling it. And like, it was like crazy. Like I was, there was like, I remember it was like a 16 year old girl who like, when I go to her Tumblr, it was like all these pictures like, you know, women doing yoga and or like, you know, like, like doing like bench pressing or something like that. And like she retumbled this poem. It's like, you know, like it's called Chin Up Motherfucker. And, uh, and she retumbled it, it was like, it was like, wow, this really gives you some perspective sometimes. Like, this made my day easier. What? Like, yeah, like, that's insane. I write poetry to make people feel better about them, about their, about themselves. And it happened. And it's nuts. Like, so, like, why not, like, love the internet? The internet's amazing. What do these things mean to you? Honesty and humor. Um, instead of answering this question, I'm gonna, I want to read this poem. Um, by Eileen Miles. Um, it's from this book, uh, A Fresh Young Voice from the Plains, which I just bought and spent way too much money on because it's really rare. I want to read it for the honesty thing. Humor, I'm not so interested in. If you want to see something funny, just like, just look outside. Shit's funny out there. Like, it's weird. But when it comes to honesty, like, that's a little bit more complicated. So, like, that's why I want to read this poem, which has, like, nothing to do with honesty. It's called Along the Strand. When I was a coke dealer, I just snorted all the profits. Or like the time I fell in love with morning, it was something I could stay with. I would stick around, but it slipped into noon, and again I fell in love at twilight. I was meditative and prayerful, and by night I was truly in love with someone I could not see. The person who invented inventions was the same one who waited to see what everyone was requesting, and then she invented inventing. I tasted that once, but now it is no longer new. The countermen placing chairs atop tables. The tables are clean and the radio plays all the new songs. What night was it that you told me how the last time you felt this way you just walked and walked? Well, I am the ghost of the coffee shops who started smoking very late. My father told me they cause cancer and I still believe they cause cancer. 
There is something wonderful about plastic tables that resemble wood, and I am dreaming of a tree by a stream that resembles plastic, for I am inventing again, and I am walking backwards. I grow deeply religious as a child, and as a well-adjusted nun, I am grateful to the child who grew me. I am grateful to Dad's tip-off concerning cigarettes, and believing in denouements, your footsteps have stopped, you are gladly resting on your couch." Vouching for the honesty of mourning he left me became someone else who I found beneath a plastic tree at noon. Vigorous twilight is our resting place, and we will exchange glowing photos in the night. Invention produces pools, and they are not in demand. I am endless walking, and a solid-colored day is, no, is more to my liking. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. The singing voice produces color, shades her day. She is a nun of my love who draws bands of smoke, which is prayer. I snorted all the prophets. I sleep on a pillow, which is my nose. I find it very religious. My mother taught me sex was dirty, which was exciting. She taught me love is romantic. I didn't start fucking till quite late. Exciting, romantic. I am quite sure it is the one thing I have invented. The times of the day, the ones with names, they are the stripes of sex, unlike romance, who dreamlike is a, con con a continuous walker. Obviously, a solid colored day is unexciting. I bring my best romance to morning. I bring my best romance to noon. Night, the old charmer, is in love with candles, holds a fistful of morning behind his back. So you are no longer walking, and this is no particular cigarette. A beautiful nun may be dreaming my life, or I am inventing again. In ancient Greece, a mystical child examines three ribbons. The oldest woman in this part of town is aware of her hair, black, white, and gray, even as she lay dying, even as she first fucked and her lover's words caressed her like smoke, inventing pools in her gorgeous and tangled black hair. So that's honesty. What is your worldview in one sentence? Fuck trying and not doing. Cause not doing is something a nigga not doing. I said fuck trying and not doing. Cause not doing is something a nigga not doing. I grew up the end big and pock bitch and got ruined. So until I got the same crib, big head in that juicy vid, bitch. I can't motherfucking stop moving. Go against me, you won't stop losing.